Hello, welcome to June 4th, 2023. My name is Kurt, and this is my daily Good Life Meditation. This is an uh, exercise that I do each and every morning, uh, a little bit after waking up. It's now uh, 4.43 a.m. I do this in order to remember my life objectives and principles, those which were outlined in my book, Going Alone. I also use this time to uh, think about the last 24 hours and whatever challenges and opportunities were of note that I met and how I handled these and if I was able to make uh, a better use of the day. And then I finish by uh, thinking about the day to come and how I will, uh, whatever opportunities and challenges I might meet so that I can uh, prepare myself to address those. I also kind of run through a rough agenda of, of what I think I'm going to do today. So I'm planning it out. Let's begin. First, last night and yesterday. I slept all right last night, um, but again, I'm not feeling rested. I got to bed uh, pretty much on time, uh, had a good sound night's sleep, woke up with the alarm, haven't had any uh, anxiety waking me up before the alarm for a long time now. I slept pretty good, but I, I don't feel rested. I've even had a full cup of coffee now, and uh, I'm still not rested. <laughs> so uh, it's been like this for a couple of weeks. Not, not sleeping as soundly. It could be the sleep apnea that's doing it. Hmm. I have been diagnosed with it, and I do have one of those machines. I just can't tolerate the mask. So yeah, it's, it's a struggle. As for yesterday, it was a good day. Um, did all of our chores, took care of all the things Yumiko and I wanted to do, and we had uh, some nice dog walks and uh, a wonderful evening together. And some great talks. It was a great, it was a banner day. And uh, today, I'll get to today in just a second, but it is a Sunday. So with all my, excuse me, all my work and chores and shopping done, it's just a day of leisure ahead. Sounds good. Okay, let's do the good life. My seven objectives are, number one, to be always ready to die. To have my life in such a state that my uh, object, my I haven't done this in so long, I can't remember how to do it well, how to do the deeper dive. I'm going to try to do the deeper dive. My life, have, being always ready to die means having my um, affairs in order, my relationships in order, and my life purpose, having met as much of that as I can. <clears throat> if not complete, at least all of these things are in effort and as settled as they possibly can be. And on a quick reflection, they are. I don't have... Uh, my life is in good shape, my relationships are in good shape, and my life's work is done. What more could I ask for? So yeah, I'm ready to die. I don't want to, I don't want to die, but I'm ready if it comes. Two, the second objective is to make good and effective use of the time that I have, to not waste my days or just let them fritter away. And I don't at all. I, I have good things that I do every day, beginning with the poem that I read first thing when I get up and uh, finishing with uh, a lovely evening with my wife every night and all the stuff in between. Three, to develop and maintain good and sound life principles. And I have, and they're all outlined in my book. So yeah, and I work on them every day. That's what I'm doing right now. Four, is to cultivate good emotional reactions. That it means that I need to become someone who doesn't get upset, uh, or at least doesn't get visibly upset, who can keep a, keep a lid on my emotions, and especially how I express my emotions. So even if I'm having a, a tough time on the inside, I can contain that and dissipate it away and not uh, cause undue upset to others. And I'm getting really good at that. It's pretty rare that I have visibly, outwardly upset moments and they don't bottle up inside because I deal with them in other ways. I deal with them by thinking about them and relating them here uh, and working them out. It's an effective approach. Five is to uh, perform good actions, just to do good things throughout the day. Big things, little things, medium things too. Number six is to recognize my true limits and my true opportunities so that I'm applying myself where I can actually do some good 
and not wasting my energies on things that uh, aren't beyond my reach. I shouldn't even be uh, uh, expending thought on things that are other than the initial app, you know, assessment. Once I access something that's beyond my reach, then uh, I can let it go. It's a very stoic approach. Or at least accept whatever is happening with that thing beyond my reach as what is happening. And then lastly, the uh, number six is to do just one thing at a time. And do that thing slowly and deliberately and carefully. To be a measured, careful, uh, patient, and deliberate man. I'm getting better at that. Okay, those are my seven objectives. Those are the things that I'm striving for each day. The ends that I hope to achieve. Some of them are states of mind, states of being. Some of them are objectives in their own right or the uh, character and uh, form of some objectives. Together they form my, my life mechanism. Now for my principles. <clears throat> and the principles are distinct from the objectives because whereas the objectives are ends, the principles are tools that help me with the means of, get, of achieving those things. There are 34 of them, and the first of these is called war. It's just a simple word that refers to my effort to be always at war with anything important that I already believe is true or that is proposed to me as something that I should believe is true. But why would I be at war with such things? Well, because I simply want to ascertain if they really are true. I don't want to believe or hold on to a belief that may be wrong. So I fight with it in a, in, in a nice way. It's like a wrestling match. See if uh, I can make it cry uncle. How do I do that? Well, that's number two. The second principle is the principle of reason. I use reason as my uh, instrument of this aforementioned war. And reason has three or four sub-principles. Honesty, objectivity, doubt, and humiliation. Being honest with myself and others. Objective in my worldview, looking at many angles, from many angles. Doubt, being a fierce skeptic, it's a frame of mind. And then finally, humiliation, being ready to accept the humiliation and even welcome the humiliation of being shown that I'm wrong. Number three, the third uh, principle is the homunculus. I don't believe in the soul. I think that's just a, a fake idea or that we make up, or it's a, it's, it's a false notion, I should say, that we make up as a, as a solution to squirrel away our apprehension and fear about death. We can use the soul as a vehicle to save ourselves. And it's, it's a comfort, but I don't think it's true. There's no, absolutely no good reason to think so. If you apply reason to this, there's no good reason to think it's true. And so the yield and, and result of the, of, of the war against, of my war against this is that it's not true. Um, so then what? Well, what do I what do I focus on if that's the case? As my uh, as my kernel of being can't be a soul because that's not true. So what else could it be? I choose what to ch select something that clearly is evidently something that's real. My consciousness. I, I can't get away from the fact that that seems to be a fact, <laughs> unless there's some some greater mechanism of the universe going on that's beyond my understanding. But even if that's the case, it seems like I'm here. <laughs> um, so I label the consciousness the homunculus, which if you look up the word, it simply means uh, used to be an adherent, a religious adherent that would hold themselves away in a little cell walled into the side of a church, in a medieval church, 
was a little hole called a squint that they would peek through and watch the service and through which food could be and water could be put in waste products pushed out. It was an interesting thing, the homunculus, the person that is trapped within. And that's why I use this term, because I feel like I, my consciousness is trapped inside my skull, right around, right behind my forehead, looking out through my eyes and listening through my ears and feeling with my fingers. You get it. So, but the key is being trapped. And that's the next principle, the principle of the anchor hold. The homunculus is trapped within that little cell, which in the medieval terms, the homunculus, the little cell that they would create at the side of the church, they called that the anchor hold. Uh, they also called these people anchorites, or anch or, and women were anchoresses. And they would be sold into their little anchorage, anchor hold, they called it. So the anchor hold to me is this body, this mortal coil in which my uh, homunculus is trapped. So those are two principles that go together. The principle number three is the homunculus, and number four is the anchor hold. And I linger on that because it reminds me that my consciousness is trapped inside this body. And when this body dies and my consciousness winks out, all evidence indicates that's the end of me. And there won't be any coming back. That'll be a long eternity uh, of dissolution and gone. Eternity of God. <laughs> I like that. Next comes the principle called uh, purpose. My purpose in life are threefold. One, to be a good husband and father that fulfills what I call my biological mandate. Two, to be a virtuous man, seeking out the improved well-being of thinking creatures. That's what, how I define virtue, basically. And then three, to fulfill whatever personal purpose I assign for myself, which for me is my... Uh, book going alone and sharing the message therein because it is a message of improved living and uh, I think it's worthwhile to share. Next comes the principle of uh, called the atomic principle. Everything in the universe is made of bits and pieces, atoms and molecules that are coming together, operating for a bit and then dissolving away. Uh, so too you and me, each of our bodies is made up with atoms, molecules, and compounds that will uh, disintegrate away when we die or be burned up or, or uh, you know, rot away, however the case may be, whenever we wind up and dead and done. And that's good to remember that. Then comes the principle of nature. Not nature like birds and bees, but nature like the way things are. And this is my reminder, this principle, that everything and everyone has some particular nature, some way that they are, some inertia that they uh, maintain. And if I can recognize what that nature is and then expect it, then I can live in better accord with that. So I spot something now that I can help me with. I'm a little bit anxious this week going into the work week because I have a meeting uh, with someone who, whose nature is unsettling to me. And using my own principles, I have to remember that that person's nature is such that they, the true limit is that I can't change their nature. But the true opportunity is that I can find a way to uh, accept that that is the way they are and then operate effectively in, in, with that fact in mind. Hmm, that'll help me. So I'm using the principle of nature then to help me to achieve the objective of recognizing true limits and true opportunities. Here comes the dog. Hi. The next principle is called uh, the pirate ride. And the pirate ride is my simple reminder and suggestion that free will is an illusion. Suggestion because I can't prove that's the case. Nor do I believe that anybody else can prove that free will does exist. 
Yet, I believe it does not exist. I know, I know. I, I, the principle of war and reason would suggest that I should give up this notion and just call this uh, terra incognito a part of the map that I can't see. But I choose not to. I just have a gut feeling that it does not, free will does not exist. I hold that opinion and notion, gulp, on faith, which is something that I view as a sin, faith itself. I'll get to that. Hmm. So there you go. If free will isn't real, if free will isn't a thing, then what? I can't say that I can operationally sustain that or even believe it in such a way that it means as any meaningful element to my life, but I believe it nonetheless, even though I can't quite operate with it because it's, 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 it's such a useful fiction to believe it's true. But if I could get to the point of believing that it wasn't true, imagine that. What would life be like then? It's a worthwhile goal, I guess, or maybe I'd be, that would drop me to send me into ruin. Next comes uh, maturity. That's the next principle which has the sub-principles of wisdom, fortitude. I need the book to help me. All this stuff's in the book. I haven't done this long version of the meditation in so long I can't remember some of the sub-principles. There's a chapter in the book called um, The Good Life that has all this stuff listed in it. The principle of maturity says, has sub-principles of wisdom, fortitude, and integrity. That's it. Wisdom, uh, because that's the sum collection of uh, experiences in life, both good, good and bad. Fortitude is our endeavor and effort to not repeat our mistakes, but to further our better decisions. And integrity is the life of uh, balance that we enjoy, where our actions are in alignment with our, our uh, what's important to us, our values. There you go. Next comes the social principle which has the sub-principles of diplomacy, justice, and conspiracy. Diplomacy is the, this interaction that we have with one another to decide our, what, what constitutes justice. And then the conspiracy is when we link arms to see that justice through. Next comes the principle of family. I certainly strongly recommend that we build a family, a community for our lives. It can be the type that you like put a ring on or the type of family that you choose, that you know, the people you choose in your life. In either case, it's a good thing to have. And there's one sub-principle here called catalyst. Catalyst, family is a catalyst towards improved ends. Like, for example, being a husband and father has been a catalyst for me to stick with it through jobs that were very difficult in order to ensure that I fulfill my commitment and that my, the better ends for my family are met. That's yielded a better life for me as well. Next comes the principle called public speaking, which has several sub-principles. Best words, which is the effort to cultivate and have at our fingertips a rich and deep vocabulary. If not to necessarily use to, to, to in your speech, but in order to have it, particularly when reading, so you can really enjoy good literature, which is another one of the sub-principles, literature, that comes a little later. I should, pro I should put it, move it, and put it right next to it. Best words, literature. Prudence. Prudence is the ability to filter our communication through our values. No, that's not right. Is to, yeah, that's it is right, to filter our communication through our values so that what we say and write is in alignment with what's important to us. That's prudence. Felicity is the ability to, as I like to say, season our communication with our emotions to just the right level, not too much, but just the right enough. Eloquence is the ability to speak well or to write well, and that comes with modeling and practice. And then there's two negatives, rumor and gossip things not to do. I'll get to more of those more in just a second. Next comes the first of, a, well, we actually we had another one, homunculus and anchor hold. Those are a pair. Here's another one that's a, it's a group of principles that are clustered together. I think there's four. Temperance, life will not go well, the horror show, and that which must be born. Those four go together. Let's explain. Temperance is the ability to control our consumption of life. 
of all things. In particular, the um, consumption of our physical consumption as well as our mental activities and our various indulgences in life. Basically everything. Not to, not to eat too much or drink too much or work too much or play too much, but just to have the right balance or even sleep too much. The sub-principles here are suffering, because when we suffer, we are, because when we are denying ourselves what we want, we suffer. Simplicity, because a simple life is a temperate life. And then apathy, a powerful tool, apathy, which links back to the objective of recognizing true limits and true opportunity. When we recognize something that is outside of our reach, we adopt a, a position of apathy towards it. It doesn't mean we don't care but we're disconnected from the consequence or the fact of that thing. Maybe not disconnected from the consequence, but we disconnect from our ability to influence that thing because it's beyond us. This would be a sudden, uh, sudden rain fall coming upon our heads out and caught out, and out of doors. Instead of railing at the heavens, which is beyond our, you know, it's not going to do any good, it's ineffectual, right? Um, we simply accept the fact, wow, I got caught outdoors without an umbrella. Maybe I'll find some place. What, what was my true opportunity? My true opportunity is to duck under that cover under the tree over there. Not get upset. I'm watching a movie right now, or it's a TV show on, on Netflix called uh, uh, Sanctuary. It's a Japanese uh, series about a young sumo wrestler who rails at the world and everything. And it's, he could definitely use a bit more apathy. Life will not go well, the next principle, remember, part of the four. Life will not go is just a simple recognition that life ain't going to go all well. Um, not just sometimes, but a lot of the time. That the moments of peace and uh, felicity are fleeting, brief, and uh, uh, to be cherished, but to recognize that they, they pass away quickly. There's a lot of stuff, tough stuff in life. The next one, the horror show. This is simply an acknowledgement that sometimes it goes to the next level from being not just difficult, but horrific. You know, diagnosis of stage four inoperable cancer, a horrible auto accident, your house burning down, whatever the case may be, horrible stuff is happening all around us um, to people and it's coming for us. Each one of us will have some episode of the horror show at least once in our life as we, as we uh, descend into death if not multiple times. That which must be born. That's the uh, next one, the fourth of the four. That which must be born, B-O-R-N-E, carried, is the fact of life will not go well and the fact of the horror show. We have to carry that. Live with it. Next is the Feast of Oful. The Feast of Oful is our, my, is, is my recognition, my, my recommendation to and I said this a little earlier, to control our upset, to not spew it out upon others and soil them in the process, but to contain it within and to find other ways to uh, let it go. And I call it a feast of offal because imagine a banquet of offal is the byproduct of the butcher's art, right? Hair and toenails and bones and tendons that the butcher can't sell on their shelf, so they grind it up into sausage, sell it that way. That's awful. Imagine spewing our awful, the, the waste and byproduct of our mental life on others by telling them, you know, I'm so mad, whatever. You know, you can just picture this, right? I don't want to do that because I don't want to hurt others. And when other people are doing it around me, I don't consume it up. It's not a, it's a feast I won't eat. I'll turn aside, let them do their thing, and then be ready with a tissue and a hug if they need it. And they will. Next comes two principles that go together, another pair. The principle of distraction and agency in the great indifference. To explain them, I kind of have to explain the second one first. Agency in the great indifference. Since I don't believe in a soul, I not, nor do I believe in God or gods, I believe that the universe is indifferent to our the fact of our existence or our suffering. The only exception to that is the fact that we are part of the universe and we care. But other than us and maybe some of our pets, uh, the universe doesn't give a damn. That's the great indifference. Distraction. 
is what we do to not see that awful fact. We want to tell ourselves that someone at large does care and will look after us and will keep us safe into eternity. And so that's the distraction that we engage in with our, our school and our hobbies and our job and our family and our religion and our sports and our God. We distract ourselves a live long day. And I think that's an unworthy endeavor. I'd rather face the great indifference, which is the message of going along. This is the first part of the book, is facing, that's what going alone is, is facing the great indifference. And then coming back from the empty wastes to build a family via the social endeavors to, have, to adopt principles and objectives and to seek out the good life. Next comes a principle that stands all on its own, the best seat in the house. Very simple one. It's simply a suggestion that we should try to be all right with who we are, where we are, and what we're doing. That's all it is. Here comes another one that's a pair. It's a, actually, it's a, it's a collection. It's three this time. The Restless Man. Three principles. The Restless Man, The Path of Wildness, and The Great, great Life Adventure. The Great Life Adventure is a key element of my book. Well, all three of these are. The restless man simply speaks to that restlessness that some of us feel in our late teens and early 20s that we want to have something in life. We want to have some adventure in our life. And if we are so bold as to do that, to step out and attempt to have such an adventure, I call that the path of wildness, which is easy to find. It's the course of a stream, leaves blown in the wind, a beast's track through the brush, and the direction of our first inclination. That's what makes it easy. If we step upon the path of wildness boldly and follow through, then the yield and the gain is what I call a great life adventure, which is our story, our story to be gained and enjoyed and told and lived out for the rest of our days. And we can have more than one adventure, a great life adventure in our lives, big, medium, and small. I used to have one every other weekend, or sometimes every weekend on a Sunday, usually every other weekend, and I built up a whole persona called Softy Papa in that process. And that cultivated, cumulatively gave me the experience of a great life adventure, all the while well, fulfilling my commitment as a husband and father. So you can do it in different ways. You could also take off and go backpack across Europe for a summer. That's a great life adventure, or whatever you want to do. The thing is, and this is the next one, it really is, this really is four principles that go together because the next one is called the risk of avoiding risk. Yeah, it is four. The next principle, remember it goes, the restless man, the path of wildness, the great life adventure. Number four is the risk of avoiding risk. This is a caution and a warning that if you do feel that restlessness at a young age and you do not do anything about it, mm, watch out. It's probably not going to go away. It may disappear for seasons of life, but it'll be back. It'll haunt you, and it'll get worse. On the flip side, if you indulge too much in the in the adventure side, then you can gain. You can go the other too far the other way, and wind up later in life with a rich portfolio of tales and nothing really of any depth, like having a family or being a parent can yield. It's all right to not have a family or be a parent but there's something that comes of that it's like choosing it's like choosing not to watch the sunrise i mean yeah you can live a fine life without watching the sunrise but if you do watch the sunrise you get to watch the sunrise <laughs> there's consequences right that's the whole idea of the risk of avoiding risk it's a trick thing to kind of balance it The next one is sin and damnation. Um, the sub-principles here are, these are the things that I consider sins in life. And the damnation comes because if you engage in any of these things, you're damned in the here and now. The sins in my worldview are seven or eight, eight or eight, yeah. Falsity, being untrue. Credulity, believing things too readily. Faith, which is belief founded upon belief which is circular and nonsense. Superstition, another form of nonsense, at least the believing of superstition is. 
um, dogma, which is belief founded upon tradition, authority, belief founded on uh, charisma or precedent or personality, or charisma or pers personality or office, and then two more which are not related to belief but just rumor and gossip. There they are again, right? Engaging in any of those eight sins, we are damned in the here and now. Damned, we are damned liars, damned fools, or damned uh, rumor-mongering gossips. The next principle is called the complete oblivion. My pro pro proposition that since we don't have a since soul isn't real, there is no God after death. That's oblivion that awaits us. There will be no reunion with our, no final reunion with our loved ones, no chance for final reconciliation and no chance for final justice. All The only way we can achieve any of those things is if we engage in them in the here and now and do the hard and challenging work of uh, living and connecting and communicating now. No second chance. No chance after death. Death is the end. Next comes the season of philosophy. The season of philosophy is just a simple reminder to keep a pen and paper handy to write down whatever words come when they come because they won't come again, usually. At least not the same way. Next comes a principle, and this is another pair, script writing and the bullseye aim. Script writing is a trick that I use to forecast what I need to do in the minutes, hours, and day ahead to plan out how I'm going to respond. So I was script writing just a little bit earlier when I was talking about this challenging, the person at work that's a challenge to me. I was script writing how I was going to deal with that person. And before that, meetings with that person this week, I will script write just before it and plan out how I respond. I have better and greater and lesser results, but the effort makes a big difference. And that speaks to the next principle, the bullseye aim. It's like I can anticipate I want to I hit the bullseye with a dart. Wisdom would suggest that I shouldn't get upset when I miss, but I should be delighted when I hit. I should expect to miss. It's rare to hit the bullseye. Likewise, it's rare, it's rare to hit our objective square in life at all, especially if we have good, challenging objectives. Next comes the uphill climb. I want to be climbing always up in life. I want to complete each day sitting in my garden, playing my guitar, watching the sun go down, having climbed to a higher vista than the day before. That's a worthwhile thing to do. The sub-principle there is the open ocean swim. It's for more for me, that sub principle, because I like to swim in the ocean. At least I used to. Next comes arena and utility. That's another principle. Life is this arena where we live. And the principles that we adopt, you can have mine if you like, or you can develop your own, are the uh, utility, they're the tools that we use to live well in this arena. And then just two more left. Nothing is enough. A very, very potent principle that I, I can't quite, I haven't quite opened the lid on, but I know there's a lot in there. I think I'm going to wait until I get to Japan to really begin exploring that. Um, but in a nutshell, it's simply a suggestion that less is so often more, as we like to say. And finally, the principle of fun. That's number 34. And the sub-principles of hope and retrospect. I used to think hope was a bad thing. I don't think anymore. Hope is the thing that gives us the, the boost and the catalyst. It's the octane in our fuel to carry on. And the principle of fun suggests that we should um, enjoy today and enjoy the remembrance of yesterday and enjoy the planning of tomorrow. It makes me smile just thinking about it. There you go. There's my 34 principles and my seven objectives laid out. It's the first time in a long time that I've done the, the full thing and talked about each of them in turn. That felt good. Last thing I need to do with this exercise is to think about the coming day. Like I said, today's a day off. It's a Sunday. I'll finish this. I'll do all my normal morning routine. And then I'll embark on 
a day of leisure at home with my wife and my dogs. Lots of reading, guitar playing, uh, dog walks, a nice lunch and dinner, and then a good, hopefully a sound sleep, and then I'll begin the work week in earnest. And with that, my exercise is done. And I wish you all the best. I wish you, hope you can be safe, but not too safe. And now my life is done, if not finished. Finishing this exercise makes it done every day. It's, I begin the day every day done.